Good afternoon, dear friends. It's always a delight to be here and to have this opportunity to share the Word of God with you. It's always a blessing when God speaks to His people using human instruments. My name is Reverend Father Patrick Gesu Tony Amon, and I will be reflecting with you on this second day of the World Communication Week on the theme, Speaking the Truth with the Heart Leads to Generosity. Our lead text will be from Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, from verse 11 to 15. The exact words that construct our first reading at Mass today. Truth. Pilate will ask Jesus when he said, I have come to bear witness to the truth. He will ask him, what is the truth? That is one question that today's man must answer if we must make meaning out of our existence and find true meaning in our mission as witnesses, whether as priests or as lay people, what is the truth? Dear friends, if we do not know what the truth is, it will be a more difficult task speaking the truth or bearing witness to the truth. Mine is not an attempt at giving an academic discussion on truth like we will find in epistemology. No. But truth is one fact. Truth is one virtue. Truth is something that is discussed heatedly, whether in religion, whether in science, whether in arts, whether in politics, whether in economics, whatever the field or the sphere of life is, everybody is in search of the truth. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 16, we see Paul on his second missionary journey with his companions, Silas, Timothy, Luke, and the other perhaps who was also a scribe. They hear a vision. Paul sees that vision, asks him to come over to Macedonia. Beautiful pieces in this pericope of Acts of the Apostle. But by a vision, he's prevented from going to Asia Minor. And instead, he turns, sails towards Philippi. He arrives at Philippi, a beautiful city. By all standards, one of the most economically vibrant cities in the Macedonian district. He gets into a city, very unlike Paul in his traditional manner. He would go to the synagogue where he would meet other believing Jews, fellowship with them, and then set about carrying out the mission for which he came, which is preaching the kerygma. But no, Paul enters into a city, a city without a synagogue. It is important to note that for there to be a synagogue in a city, there has to be at least 10 Jewish men. We don't find that number in Philippi. What does that say to you about Philippi? It tells you it's a Gentile pagan enclave. It's a place where people are giving to so many other things apart from religious consciousness, apart from Christianity, apart from belief in the afterlife. There were people that were into merchandise. We are told he comes in there, then he begins to look for where he would find a few believing Jews. And he's informed by the bank of the river that a few devout women who gather there. And he goes, meets them. And begins to talk to them. Acts of the Apostles 16. We get down to verse 14 and 15. And as Paul would sit with them. And begin to speak to them. Expounding as I suppose. The message about the mystery that is in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit will touch a particular woman. The devout woman from Thyatira. Lydia. And God will open her heart. And she will accept the good news. Dear friends, speaking the truth with the heart. There is something about the message that St. Paul brought to Philippi. Although there were few Christians there, although there was no church there, he came with a message. His message was Christ. He preached about Christ. He spoke with emphasis. The women who listened saw the conviction in his eyes. 
They saw the passion with which he spoke. Pay attention, Paul had risked a lot to come to Philippi with the message. We are told that at the entrance to the city of Philippi, there is an inscription that no one is permitted to bring any other religion into Philippi. So, religiously, it was not a welcoming environment. His life was at risk. In Philippi, we did not have 10 devout Jewish men, which means it was not a religiously receptive environment. Now the people would even be asking, what is a supposed preacher doing in a, in, a, in a band of women? Why is he talking to them by the riverside, not even in a church, not in a decent meeting place? But not for Paul. Passion, zeal for the truth would have swallowed him up that Paul sits down and begins to speak. I can imagine that Paul the mystic will get into some kind of ecstasy when he begins to break the word. He talks to them gently but persuasively. His voice calm, steady but convincing. He speaks to her heart. The woman's heart that was beginning to beat begins to break. And the Bible says she accepts the word. She receives the good news. Ah, the truth that liberates. The Bible says you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Pay attention to the fact that Lydia, although Gentile, had already had an experience of God. She knew about God. She knew about what it means to be a worshiper. But until that time, she had not as yet received Christ as her Lord and Savior. Christ was not at the center of her life. Lydia was a wealthy woman. We are told she was in the purple dye trade. Philippi was a place known for its bronze and brass. And Theatira was a town known for its purple dye. The people who dealt with the purple dye business, whether selling the dye or selling the purple clothing, were people who were trading with the aristocrats. She had money. She was a woman of substance. She was a woman of means, but she hadn't Jesus. And the message that Paul will bring is the truth that gives life. The Davaya Veh, the word of God that when you hear, your heart will begin to beat. Remember the encounter between Jesus and the disciples on the, Emmaus, on the way to Emmaus. The Bible says when he began to break the word for them on that journey and then he breaks the bread for them, they will ask themselves, did our hearts not beat within us as he expounds the scriptures, as he broke the word that contained the truth that liberates. Paul does the same thing. And Lydia says, I surrender to the Lordship of Jesus. No more money. No more business. Nothing else is going to occupy my life but the truth. The truth that has given me life. And she goes down on her knees, lifts up her hands in prayer, tears gushing down her eyes, and she begs the apostles, baptize me that I might be saved. And she and her entire household are baptized. Ah, when you speak the truth from the heart, with the heart, in compassion, it leads to conversion like we were here yesterday in our series. But beyond conversion, when the Lord breaks your heart open, it extends you out. You don't want to live alone. It is so, so self-consuming to just want to live for yourself. And Lydia will extend her hand of fellowship to this. If you find me fitting, if you find me worthy, if you think my conversion is anything to go by, Please come stay in my house. I'm imagining what the house of Lydia would be like. A comfortable place with space. If it was a small apartment, she would not be able to house the entire missionary group that came with Paul. And she would take no for an answer. And so the truth leads to generosity. She throws herself at the service of the gospel. She wants to take care of the ministers. She wants them to stay in her house. She wants to take... She wants to be the one who takes care of their very needs. We speak the truth with the heart. It leads to generosity. Therefore, remember that when we go down that pericope, we will discover that after Paul, Silas, Timothy will leave the home of Lydia the next day, they will meet a woman, they will deliver the woman from the demons that were possessed, that had possessed her hitherto. They'll be thrown into prison. They'll be, they'll be flogged. They'll be cajoled. But as soon as they are set free miraculously from the prison, the next place they will go back to is Lydia's house. Huh. 
what truth does. It had made Lydia not just a receptacle, but also a tributary. She receives the good news and then she shares it abroad. Many times we think that conversion of the other person is based on our eloquence. It's based on the clarity of our theology. It's based on how persuasive we are, but no brothers. My personal life experience has taught me many times that indeed conversion is an action of the Holy Spirit. The slightest, smallest, insignificant things we do are actually the things that make the deepest impressions on the lives of those around us. And that is why we are called not just to be speakers, not just to be teachers, but to be witnesses, that our life will correspond in line with the correspondence theory of truth. Our lives will correspond with the realities that we are espousing to the people, expounding for them vividly. That our lives will cohere with the depositatum fide, the deposit of faith that we have been taught and entrusted with. That will be people who will be pragmatic in our approach, not just mere speakers of the word. And when we do that, we surrender to God, who is the one who brings about confession. I want to think it was not just the eloquence of Paul, but it was the action of the Holy Spirit that was manifestly working in the lives of the disciples because they were willing to go because in spite of the obstacles, they did not look the other way. They did not turn tail. They didn't leave the city. They didn't bail on Philippi. They went. And God blessed their ministry. So many prisoners want to walk in difficult missions. There are people to be spoken to, to be touched there, but no want to walk in the city centers. Many people who are so shy of carrying out the apostolate of speaking the truth to drug addicts, speaking the truth to prostitutes, speaking the truth to cultists. But who would take the gospel to them? And how would we present the message to them that they will be caught to the heart? Brothers, I think in this contemporary 21st century Nigeria that I walk in, I see a lot of people, young people, middle-aged people, elderly people leaving the church and going after things that they think appeal more to them. And I see many a pastor so scared to go out in search of the lost sheep. But I also think that if we take the approach of Paul, which is the example of Jesus, the compassionate father, and go out in search of them gently but firmly, speaking the truth to them, leading them to experience Jesus and the transforming power of the Holy Spirit, they will also, like Lydia, open up their hearts to accepting Jesus who is himself, the way, the truth, and the life. This immediately reminds me of the encounter Jesus had with Zacchaeus. When he spoke the truth, and Zacchaeus was caught to the heart. He immediately responds in generosity. He takes Jesus to his home. He sobs him. He tells him, I'm going to make restitution. He says, I'm going to give whatever is left, half of it to the poor. It leads to generosity. And so many people, when they receive Jesus deep down in their hearts and experience the metanoia that comes with conversion, they open up to charity. They open up to generosity. In this second day of our communication week, I pray that the Holy Spirit who's coming we have with in a big way on Pentecost will touch again and rekindle that pastoral and missionary vigor in the hearts of pastors that will go out courageously, joyfully, bearing witness, especially to those we find around the peripheries of our society, drawing them lovingly yet consistently to the love of the Father. And I pray that as he touches their hearts, it will open them up to generosity. And the church will indeed be a place of joy, of friendship, of brotherhood, as it was in the early Christian community times. I pray that God will bless his words in our lives. And may the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable before him who is our creator and redeemer, but now and forever. Amen. God bless you.